Welcome, 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 everybody, to The Straight Line with Ryan Leaf. 15 days from the NFL draft. Uh, everybody getting excited. Uh, that number one overall pick in the marketplace is shifting and changing. Where are we going to line up? I know where I am. I'm going to give that to you a little bit later here. Uh, Phil Steele is going to join us on the show. This is pretty cool. Uh, every college football season, uh, I go to the college football Bible. And that is his college football um, prep magazine. Uh, he starts it up immediately when the season ends, talks to every single coach, puts together the rosters. He's going to join us here in a little bit to talk about the upcoming season uh, and what to expect and what goes in to producing, uh, I think, you know, the, the best guide to preparing at least analysts or fans out there who are wondering about their teams each year. And every year. Let's start in the NFL, though. Uh, the Falcons, they continue to do some things outside the box a little bit, all right? Rebuild the defense that needs to get better. They acquire former number th three overall pick, Jeff Akuda, for a fifth round pick. Now, this is, this is significant. Now, it, it, it hadn't gone great for Akuda in Detroit. I thought he had his best season a year ago. Under Dan Campbell, there was a lot of injuries. I think there was a lot of speculation because he was a no-brainer coming out of Ohio State at the time. And to see him shipped off um, for a fifth-round pick, that's, that's a bit alarming. And if I'm the Atlanta Falcons, I think you've really won in this situation, especially, especially if he can live up to a bit of what he was expected to do in Detroit. Now, this – immediately puts the Detroit Lions, who were already, I feel, in the market for a top-tier uh, cornerback, whether it's Devin Witherspoon or Christian Gonzalez, Joey Porter Jr., those three guys' names have been batted about. They for sure are going to draft a corner now uh, in their top 10 pick. We'll see where that leads. We'll see how this leads for the Atlanta Falcons as well. They bolster their team in the offseason. Let's see what Arthur Smith and uh, that, that team can produce because they're going to have to. At some point, Arthur Blank is going to have to look down at uh, his fellow Arthur there in the, the office below him and say, hey, wh what am I paying you for? Let's, let's, get, let's get after it. The Bucks Pro Bowl linebacker, Devin White, he has apparently requested a trade. This is something, of course, that had – I think had some implications going back to last season, in particular in that game against the Baltimore Ravens where Lamar Jackson just ran roughshod over the entire defense. Devin White got called out a bunch by former Bucks, by a, for a bunch of former players around it. This is one of those situ situations very similar to Raquan Smith in Chicago in terms of where he was at on his rookie contract what he was looking for in terms of an extension, and the fifth year. And if this is something that Tampa Bay feels like they can do to move away from, save themselves some money, cap, who, who, which is a team that's cap-strapped, okay. I still think he's a pretty darn good player. Uh, middle linebackers in this league are, are incredibly impressive. Um, it, would sh it wouldn't shock me. But it would have to be a lot of compensation, I feel, for them to move off of Devin White, who you go back to a Super Bowl season, he was, he was one of the most important pieces to that defense. It was incredibly, um, incredibly well played. So we'll see where that goes. Uh, let's go to college. Uh, speaking of Phil Steele, USC, surprising move a bit. They hire former Arizona Cardinals head coach Cliff Kingsbury as a senior offense as uh, analyst. Now, let me preface this to you. An analyst at the college football level is not part of the coaching staff that can be on the field all the time, right? They cannot be on the field interacting with the players. Uh, they are mainly set in the building and they can be hidden well and they can bring a lot of value. I was just in Oklahoma a week ago and two things I did not know about his coaching staff as I was walking in and out of 
Brett Venable's office, out walks Seth Luttrell, former North Texas head coach who was fired this last year. And then out of another office comes Matt Wells, former Texas Tech head coach who was fired just over a year ago. He's got both these former head coaches in those offices working as analysts. Uh, the amount of brain power around football and the football IQ in that office is impressive. And to bring somebody in like this to USC when he has a chance to educate and build up and continue to improve, uh, you know, the best player in college football from a year ago in Caleb Williams, I think it's a great opportunity. Lincoln Riley knows what he's doing. Now, it's Lincoln Riley's offense. He's going to call the plays. But ironically, this is where Cliff Kingsbury started before he took the Arizona Cardinals head coaching job. He had been fired at Texas Tech was hired as the offensive coordinator at USC, and then the Arizona Cardinals came swooping in when they knew they had the number one overall pick and most likely were going to take Kyler Murray and picked up uh, Cliff Kingsbury. He'll be on that staff. Now, uh, is it similar in rehabilitation as to what Nick Saban does? Maybe. Is he there for one year and then moves on as an offensive coordinator? I was a little surprised that Bill Belichick didn't go a little harder after Cliff Kingsbury as the offensive coordinator for his Patriots this offseason, instead landing on a former offensive coordinator for the Patriots, Bill O'Brien. We'll see how that plays out. All right, NFL draft, like I said, 15 days away. Where does that leave us? Bryce Young was firmly in the second slot for almost the entirety of the offseason in terms of who was going to go uh, first overall. And uh, it was C.J. Stroud forever at minus, I think, 150. And uh, now that has shifted. Bryce Young has now moved up significantly. He is minus one. He's minus two twenty-five now on PointsBet uh, sportsbook app. As C.J. Stroud is at plus one fifty. I'm going to tell you this right now, people. Okay. There is more data that comes in, like the cognitive reactionary testing that Bryce Young apparently has has uh, done a tremendous job with. That's significant, but I tell you right now, for as much as you hear from the likes of the Carolina Panthers and the Houston Texans, they have their mind made up, okay? They know who they're drafting. I believe they've known who they were drafting for some time now. No one makes a mediocre, me, meteoric, more, ha, three, two, one. No one makes this giant leap up the draft board or all of a sudden it's a different conversation. It, it doesn't happen, okay? There's no one making a huge rise. Hendon Hooker, if he goes in the first round, he was always considered to be a first-round quarterback, okay? This has not just happened because of late, because people started talking about it, because I started talking about it. It was always the case. And if you want to make money here, right, and that's the whole point, if you want to make money around the NFL draft, go all in on C.J. Stroud at plus 150 being the number one overall pick. He is. If all things are equal, which I think they are very close to being with him and Bryce Young, they're going to go with the bigger quarterback who had just as much success, who was just as accurate, who was just as much a leader. That is it. Do not be swayed. Do not be swayed by all the talk over the last week. You have 15 days. I think they're gradually going to come back closer. So if you have your best moment at plus 150 right now for C.J. Stroud, go get it. Go get it. That's what we'll be doing. All right, when we come back, Phil Steele joins the show, talks about the upcoming college football season, whether or not the three quarterbacks that I think are pretty darn great that are going to be playing one more year uh, in college football – would they be uh, ahead of the guys right now that everybody's talking about in this year's draft? When we come back right here on The Straight Line with Ryan Leaf. Welcome back, everybody, to The Straight Line with Ryan Leaf. Uh, real special guest today. Uh, during the offseason here, I just got back from Oklahoma. It's spring ball time. Uh, our next guest, Phil Steele, the, uh, the gospel of college football that comes out every fall, uh, put together by him and his staff, is, uh, is an immeasurable um, 
piece to to analysts, to fans, to everybody, um, and we'd like to welcome him to the show right now. Phil, how are we doing today? Good to see you. Yeah, I'm doing great, Ryan. How about yourself today? I'm doing well. Uh, you made a point uh, just off air here that uh, you know college football is the end all be all for you, right? You are invested in that that only, uh, and uh, this is. Is this the funnest part of the season for you, getting to start to put together what the preseason is going to look like, or do you ultimately, when you have the the magazine come out, be able to kind of rest and, and watch the sport of college football? Yeah, you know, my, my favorite two months of the year, probably, Ryan, are June and July because there's no deadlines, and I get to spend a little bit more time with my daughter, Savannah, and do a little traveling and things like that, but uh you know, the magazine season, six months, we started the uh, Sunday after Thanksgiving and go all the way through the first week of June. And uh, right now we are coming up my favorite part of the magazine, which is talking to the head coaches. Uh, last year, I talked to about 120 of the 133 head coaches that we can make it 125 this year. Well, that's amazing. I was just down in Oklahoma uh, working with the, the Sooners this last week. Uh, Coach Venables, that team, right? Six and six a year ago, not what People in Oklahoma expect uh, Lincoln Riley goes away, but I do feel like a culture shift. I do feel like he's the right guy for the job. What's your thoughts on the on the Sooners and, and maybe what the expectations are for this team who will be heading to the SEC after this year? Yeah, it should clearly be a bounce back year for uh, Oklahoma this year. You're looking at the fact that last year was a rare losing season for him, uh, coming in at six and seven. Uh, they've got Dylan Gabriel back at quarterback. I remember last year he got injured early. That affected him a little bit. Uh, the defense, I thought, underperformed last year. They should be much better with seven starters back this year. They got seven starters back on offense. I think that offensive line, they had in guys like Walter Rouse and Caleb Schaefer, uh, a couple of his transfers on the offensive line are going to help. Getting Stogner back at tight ends good. So overall, I, I think Oklahoma is going to be one of the top teams in the Big 12 this year. The Big 12 last year, was one of those uh, was the conference where top to bottom you could put, call for an upset every week. The bottom was just as strong as the top. We saw TCU ended up getting to the title game with Kansas State. Nobody really expected that. I think uh, Oklahoma is uh, going to be back towards the top this year. How ironic is it that uh, since Texas and Oklahoma declared their intentions to leave for the SEC in consecutive years, right? The Big Twelve has stepped up. Oklahoma State, Baylor in the first. Big 12 championship, and then last year, TCU and Kansas State. I think it leads to your point that this may be the deepest conference in all of football. Yeah, and you look at the additions they have this year, Ryan. You know, teams like BYU, uh, Cincinnati, uh, UCF, all coming in since uh, coming into the, the league. Uh, who do you put at the bottom? I mean, it used to be a no-brainer, Ryan. You just take Kansas, put them at the very bottom, and, and move on. But who's the other nine going to be in the Big 12 but now Kansas is good, so it's uh, it's pretty tough to figure out who's which ones are going to be at the top and the bottom. I know when I did a, uh, I did like a pre uh, ranking of all the teams prior to to talking to the coaches, and the Big Twelve was the one conference that was the most confusing to me. Where at the end I'm like, yeah, I, I don't even know where to put these teams. Yeah, it's it, it's going to be a lot of fun, and I think uh, my. Uh... Uh, alma mater's conference, the Pac-12, which will be the last year with USC and UCLA. I think it's going to make for a very interesting conference this year as well. One of the breaking news points from a, a couple days ago yesterday, uh, USC, they hired back uh, Cliff Kingsbury to be an offensive analyst. And I was explaining to our audience a little bit about what an analyst at college football is and how their input and what they're able to do, not be able to coach on the field with the players and stuff like that. How, what do you think of, uh, of Lincoln Riley bringing back in a guy with some NFL experience, a guy that's really knowledgeable of the Mike Leach kind of system, which, which Lincoln runs to, to be an analyst there at USC? Oh, it's it's a great fit, and uh, you, you're seeing a lot of the top programs like Alabama. It was the first ones to start using the analyst, and uh, it, it's just as a, a great thing for a a coach like uh, Coach Kingsbury, who doesn't have to take a full time job right now because he's got the uh, the payout coming from the Cardinals. Works out great for him, and it works out great for USC. And you know, the Pac-12 last year, Ryan was really the top six teams and the bottom six teams. We really had a clear line of delineation uh, there, and it may be like that again this year. You've got USC, UCLA, Oregon, Oregon State, 
uh, all at the top, you know, along with teams like Utah, which, of course, won the conference last year. Uh, and so you've got six really strong teams at the top. Washington, of course, included with Michael Penix coming back. Those six, I think, are, are all teams that are clearly capable of winning the Pac-12 this year. Should be a fun race. Yeah, it's uh, the quarterback position. This year it's been all about the SEC in terms of quarterbacks at the next level. The NFL This easily could be the Pac-12 in that conversation next year with Bo Nix, Caleb Williams, and Michael Penix Jr. All right, let's look at the preseason poll, uh, the top 10 uh, projection. Georgia comes in at number one. I don't see anything that would derail this team as of right now I don't see a team out there other than maybe Alabama what was what does LSU look like with with Brian Kelly in in year two but I mean how good of a chance do they have of three-peating again yeah they're well they're going to be favored in all 12 games probably close to double digits uh but as we saw last year Ryan let's go back to the first playoff game Ohio State outplayed Georgia and Ohio State probably deserved to win that football game Georgia got the late comeback, the late win, and and pulled it out, and then went on to just demolish TCU in the national title game. So uh, on any day, I mean, Ohio State's got the talent to play with Georgia. Alabama's got the talent. I think Michigan's got the talent to play with Georgia. So as much as Georgia will be the preseason number one team, pretty much a consensus preseason number one team this year, uh, because last year, remember, they had all those losses in the NFL, and everybody doubted Georgia. Georgia won it all. So I think you're going to see Georgia probably be definitely favored in all their games this year. But the the possibility exists for someone to knock them off. Clearly in Alabama, Ohio State, Michigan all have their opportunities. And we'll see what – I'm really interested to see what Brian Kelly does in year two. Uh, You know, to get to the SEC championship in year one where I I don't necessarily think a lot of people thought it was, uh, uh, you know, necessarily going to work. Uh, He's done a tremendous job. All right, let's go to the AP prediction poll. I – Three, four, and five all stay in the Big Ten. Ohio State at three, Michigan at four, and Penn State at five. Um, James Franklin has done a tremendous job there. I I think he doesn't get enough credit for how good he's continued to be year in, year out. Unfortunately, it's just been playing, you know, you know, second fiddle to the likes of Michigan and Ohio State. Is there a a chance that they may get over the top of these two teams? Uh, or are they just always going to be, uh, you know, third in a in a race right now in the Big Ten? Well, they have played Ohio State close each of, of the last couple of years. Yes, uh, last year, the Michigan game was embarrassing. Uh, they got totally blown out. But prior to that, they had played good games against Michigan. I think when you look at the talent that Penn State has top to bottom, I know they lose their quarterback in Sean Clifford, but Drew L.R. is a guy who fans wanted to be the quarterback last year, probably has a more NFL upside You've got Singleton and you've got Allen in the backfield, so that's a nice combination. Uh, they've got one of the top uh, offensive linemen in the country uh, at left tackle. The defense looks solid top to bottom. And this year, you know, I, I believe they host Michigan and travel to Ohio State. Ohio State has to travel to Michigan and host Penn State. If there's ever a year for Penn State to break through and actually get the that Big Ten title, this is probably it this year. And uh, the key is going to be the quarterback position. Will Drew Alar live up to the uh, pr- the billing that he had coming out of high school? Because he is surrounded by talent. Eight starters back on offense, eight on defense. Uh, Penn State's very capable of doing it this year. I hope so. I'd love to see James Franklin kind of take that next that next step. Uh, met him when he was really starting out in his coaching career. He was his first day as a graduate assistant. Phil was the day of my pro day workout at Washington wow. State when he showed up there to to be a graduate assistant for for Mike Price at the time. So I've watched his career really flourish. Uh, I want and hope the best for him in Happy Valley. All right, let's go to the ACC. Florida State really made a jump. Mike Norvell was given some, some time, some leeway to build the culture, build what he needed to around there. Jordan Travis uh, played his tail off a year ago. They lost some games that I thought they, they probably should have won late, but but they had to figure out ways to, to win those types of games. This is for the first time. They're ranked ahead of Clemson in the predictor. And uh, you know, the question is, does Florida State finally maybe take that step and get to the ACC crown for the first time since 2014? Yeah, and I think you hit it right on the head, Ryan, when you said that they lost a lot of close games last year. In fact, if you look at this team statistically, they were the best team 
in the ACC statistically last year. They were plus something like 165 yards per game. Uh, I thought all my power ratings had them the best team in the ACC at the end of the year. And you look what they have coming back. Uh, they've got eight starters back on offense this year. They've got they had last year's transfers, this year's transfers, uh, ten starters back on defense. Uh, Jordan Travis going to be the key. I think there is a drop off if Jordan something was to happen to Jordan Travis. Uh, but I, I do think with Travis, with the, the talent they have coming back, the biggest question mark I have for Florida State winning the ACC this year, they do have to travel the Death Valley and play Clemson. So that's going to be the big key thing there. But I think talent-wise, they're there. Uh, very impressive bowl game. Very impressive finish to the season last year. Yeah, I, I got the opportunity to spend uh, uh, a week with the with the Seminoles and their coaching staff and the team and just just really liked what – Mike Norvell was able to teach. And I don't think at blue blood universities like this, sometimes when a new coach comes in and there's that struggle, you're not given a lot of time to build what you, what your vision is. And that's usually why you go hire a head coach. So I'm glad we've gotten to see that. Let's go back to the big 12 a little bit. You spoke about the new teams that are coming into the mix this year, BYU, uh, UCF, Houston, and Cincinnati. Is there a team out of those newcomers that you think – could really vie for uh, for a title and have the success, the most success in 2023? Uh, I think of the four, uh, you know, when you look at Cincinnati, uh, BYU, Houston, they've all lost considerable players from last year. I think UCF comes in the best loaded team for that. Uh, UCF was a team that very nearly won the American Conference last year. They probably need to keep uh, Plumlee healthy. Uh, last year, his injuries coming out of the game as often as he did, uh, probably hurt them down the stretch. But uh, I think if Plumlee stays healthy, I like what Gus Malzahn is doing there at UCF. And and they have the opportunity to step in there and compete. And, you know, let's let's be honest, Ryan. Nobody thought TCU was going to do it last year. I didn't. No. I, I, like everybody else, I had TCU in the lower half of the standings. And at the, at the end of the year, in the middle of the year, they're winning all these close games. And you're like, how are they winning these games? And yet they kept building and building. And as you know, Ryan – you gain confidence as you gain victory. So a good start is, I think, the key to any team winning the Big 12. You gain a little bit more confidence week by week. So of the four, I would say UCF probably has the best chance. I won't pick them to win the Big 12. I probably won't have them in my top two or three, but uh, I think they would have the best chance. Uh, I, I agree with you. I, I think that uh, you know John Reese Plumley is a guy that I think is underrated, and uh, I expect some big things from him this year. Okay. Um, this one's interesting for me. I grew up with the Nebraska Cornhuskers as being the predominant, uh, you know, team in college, all of college football. We even played them in '95 when I was a, a redshirt freshman at Washington State at Memorial Stadium. It's just, uh, it's a behemoth. And what we've seen over the last decade or so, or really since you know Bo Pelini at the end, uh, Matt Rule's hired after five poor years with Scott Frost, where everybody thought was going to be the shift and the change. I have a fear that it's just it's going to be incredibly hard to recruit and win at Nebraska now what co- with what college football looks like. Am I am I hyperbolic there is Matt Rule a guy that can change the fate of Nebraska football and make them into a winner again? You know, uh, I, I agree with you Ryan and the fact that in the, I think back in the 70s Nebraska's strength was they had a better weight room than everybody else. They developed the players better than everybody else and they were able to attract athletes from across the country due to the brand name of Nebraska and uh, in Oklahoma. They don't have those advantages anymore. Everybody's got a great weight room. Everybody uh, has that. And like you said, who wants to go to Nebraska and play? But I do think Matt Rule has that potential. Uh, You know, when he took over at Temple, expectations were low. He left there high. When he took over at Baylor, I don't think anybody expected him to turn around. In fact, when he took over at Baylor, uh, your question was, why are you taking this Baylor job? They're probation. They got right. all this stuff going on. It's an ugly job. Why take it? Three years later, they're playing in a, a January 1 bowl game. So I think Matt Rule can get it turned around. They've got talent to work with. Uh, it's going to be a slower process. I don't think you're going to see them become Nebraska again overnight. But I think he can get them there. And in this era of transfer football, it really resi- relies on the head coach. Everybody's got great facilities. Uh, you can get players to play there, and the key is winning. And, uh, and Matt Rule is a winner. I hope to see it. Uh, you know, when Nebraska's better, when Nebraska's good, it makes it's it's better for college football in general. Okay, uh, 
you always have great insight into into uh, who you think may be a surprise team uh, each and every year when you uh, when you release your your magazine. Is there a team in 2023 right now that that may surprise teams? May surprise teams, people, everything. Kind of like TCU did a year ago, just jumps out of nowhere and kind of makes a a splash on the scene. Yeah, I got one, Ryan. All right. But, uh, you know, a magazine comes out in two months. I'm <laughs> you're going to hold on. You're going to hold on to that one to go to your best. All right. I, I'm going to give you mine. That one out I'm going to give you mine. The- How about that? <laughs> I'll give you mine. I think it. I think it's another team that's going to come out of the Big Twelve. I really do, and I think it's the Texas Tech Red Raiders. Um, Joey McGuire for me was. Now I love Matt Wells, and the team was had five wins when they fired him. They did. They just. They wanted to go a different direction, and they went out and got the guy that if he ripped off his shirt right now would probably have a huge tattoo of the state of Texas on his chest, right? He is a, a special coach. He's put together a good staff. I think that uh, um, you know the, the, the quarterback situation in Shuck, in Tyler Shuck, is going to be a big difference maker. I, I think this team's going to be really, really good. See how they improve on defense. But that, that's, that would probably be my surprise team out there if people were looking into one. Yeah, and I, th- I think when you look at Texas Tech, you hit it on the head. I mean, Joe McGuire's a guy where, you know, uh, each of the coaches' interviews, Ryan, uh, generally you go over every player on the team, they take about an hour. You get off the phone with Joe McGuire, and you're like, man, I, I want to go play for this yeah. guy. You know, he's, yep. he, he's, he definitely brings a, a good good vibe to him. They've got 11 starters back on offense, as you mentioned, uh, with Tyler Shuck back at QB. Uh, they lose Weston Wright, but they plug in Rusty Stats, an uh, offensive lineman from Western Kentucky, Cole Spencer, another Offense linemen, so they've they've got plenty of talent on offense. The defense, the biggest question I have is who's going to replace uh, Tyree Wilson yeah. because Wilson was their best player on defense, but they've got six starters back overall. And and that Big Twelve, I mean, and any given day anybody could beat anybody. So I, I I like Texas Tech. I think that's a good pick, Ryan. I appreciate that. Yeah, I like him a lot. Um, uh, really like to your point, like him as a head coach. That's uh, that's a big part of it. And in college football, it's about having the right guy at the helm and the difference that can make for a university, for a fan base, all of it. Uh, Just a giant thank you, Phil, before we let you go. Uh, Your magazine uh, helps out so much. I call games on the weekends. I'm on the radio, you know, 15 hours a week. I do this show daily uh, during the fall, and I can't tell you how much of an impact – you give someone like me with the education uh, and the knowledge so we can, you know, we, we know what we're talking about when we're, when we're analyzing games week to week. So I really appreciate you and I'm really grateful for you to be on today. So thank you. I appreciate that, Ryan. I got to tell you, the magazine process is six long months of racing, racing, racing to get this thing perfect. And you wonder at times you say, why am I doing this? Why, why am I killing myself for six months? Comments like that is the reason why. I appreciate that, and it makes me know that the magazine is well thought of and valuable, and that's going to keep me going. It is. It's it's incredibly valuable. Uh, the day I'm able to to go and get it on the book stand, um, I know, and, and I fly so much. It's perfect. I, I I get into that seat. I open it up. I crack it up, and I uh, crack it open, and I start you know devouring all the stuff while I'm heading to places like Lubbock, Texas, or uh, you know, Death Valley, uh, uh, um, South Carolina, all, all, all those things are, are incredibly helpful. So, again, thank you. Phil Steele, everybody, uh, joining us here today on The Straight Line. Thanks again. Thank you, Ryan. All right, everybody, there you go. A little college football mixed in with the uh, NFL side of things. Still no news on Rogers' watch. 15 days away, everybody, to the NFL draft. Also, no new news on Lamar Jackson. We'll keep you posted if anything does, but – Most likely, we are in the waiting game, people. All right, enjoy the rest of the week. We'll get closer to the NFL draft, and we'll talk to you soon right here on The Straight Line with Ryan Leaf. 